thought I'd start out a little bit by introducing myself as an artist. I've done, I've done a lot more work than the money art you see here. I was born in Rutherford, New Jersey, and I grew up in a house uh, full of art. My father was a painter, and so my sister also became an artist, and my niece is an artist, so it kind of runs in the family. I had a lot of support growing up to be an artist, which a lot of kids didn't get. And so when I was a kid, I tried a lot of different things. I drew, I made things, but my first love was actually photography. And so by the age of 15, I had a working darkroom in my basement, and I processed and printed uh, my own 35 millimeter film. I was active in photography in high school. Uh, I was a film and photography major at Bard College. And just two years ago, I, res I, uh, I retired from a 38-year career as a commercial photographer and director of photography in New York City. But throughout all that time, I made art. So this is some of the work that I did in my uh, earlier years, in my 20s and 30s, a lot of uh, surrealism and fantasy. And a lot of my earlier influences were artists like uh, Rene Magritte, Salvador Dali, and uh, even my father, who was a painter. That's some of my father's work. Uh, he was a very good oil painter. He did a lot of surrealism, mainly in the 1960s and 70s when I was growing up as a kid. And uh, I would often spend time up in my father's studio just hanging out, because frankly, he spent all of his time up there, so the time I could get as a quality time with my father was I went up to his studio and hung out. So I, I watched him paint all these paintings and worked on <coughs> other paintings next. So growing up with stuff like this around the house, it really influenced my aesthetic and my artistic, my artistic mind. But my father was a painter, and I tried painting, and, but I don't like brushes. Brushes don't like me, so my main... Uh, medium was actually colored pencil. Next. So that's one of my early pencil works. Um, so I used mainly pencil, colored pencil, graphite, and pen and ink for my uh, earlier work. And so I did a lot of magazine covers and freelance illustration assignments, book covers, magazines, and gaming products for about 20 years or so. You can see a lot of my early work that kind of set the stage for the money art were things like this, where I would use a lot of decorative elements like borders and decorative elements as well as multiple images in the same drawing, as well as words and images together, as you see in the money art. Is that pencil? Uh, that's colored pencil, yeah. And it's, it's about 20 by 30 inches in the original. <coughs> and so, and also it's about ideas. A lot of my earlier work was about ideas, and so was the money art. So I, looking back after doing money art for 15 years, I did notice that some of my earlier work, next, really set the stage for the money, you can see a lot of the same aesthetics in terms of borders and words and images together. And also my early work as a photographer, uh, I think also led me to become a printmaker. Because photography is in multiples, so you make prints, and the same thing with the money art, it's printmaking. So a lot, of, a lot of the strands of my life really converged to make money art. Next. So, what is money art? Money art, essentially, as the name implies, it's art that looks like money. And uh, by the way, don't be, don't be shy about laughing at my work. It's, it is satire. It's supposed to be funny. There's lots of puns and jokes. This is uh, Conspiracy Nation. I try to fit in all the conspiracy theories in here. And my favorite part is actually here is an alien chasing cows. <laughs> to, to them, you know? So you really have to look at a lot of little fine details. There's a lot of stuff packed in there. But uh, money is one of the foundational elements of our culture. It drives society and capitalism. Money often dictates government policy. And money often guides our own uh, decisions and behaviors. So money really is the prime mover of our entire world. And I find that the perfect genre for political satire and commentary, which is how I use it. Now, ever since childhood, we've all been trained to see inherent value in a piece of paper with some pictures on it. Uh, it really has no inherent value at all but we have a kind of a consensual reality where we all kind of agree that this piece of paper with pictures on it has value. Um, so I exploit that emotional reaction that we've all been trained to have to empower my work and my messages. And it really gives my work a false sense of history and authority. Now, there are various different types of money art. There's, there's currency notes, there's stock certificates, coupons, stamps, bonds almost anything that can reference the visual language of financial documents. And money art uses its own kind of visual language of financial documents. And it requires a certain amount of visual clues to trigger that emotional response that we have to kind of call it money. 
And those kind of clues consist of a certain uh, visual language, and that includes things like an issuing authority or a state, as in this case, the indebted states of America, which for me is often the title of the piece, and very often the clearest statement of the intent of the work. It should have a denomination or value, as in this case, a trillion dollars. It should have a vignette or a portrait, either on the front or the back. And it should also be numbered and dated. Then again, all fine art prints are also numbered and dated. But for me, all these things can be subverted for the purposes of satire. So I invite you to look closely at all the pieces in the gallery. Every single element, every number, every signature, every little thing has been hacked for a purpose for satire. So in terms of aesthetics, um, money art uses engravings or line art almost exclusively. And they use decorative elements such as borders, textures, medallions, seals, and that creates a very layered, complex textural uh, depth, which I really enjoy. And it uses words and images together. And, those, and using those together can often make a much more complex statement than a simple image. And it also is an opportunity for more puns and jokes. I love to make puns and jokes in my work, as my wife will tell you, I love puns. Now you may think, and it may be true, that this forces you to work within pretty tight restrictions. But I found that that's not a bad thing. Like a sonnet or a haiku, artistry is often defined as working within limitations. Like Picasso had a blue period, where it was just he just used blue pigments. Or Mondrian only used geometric shapes, thick black lines, and primary colors. Or Seurat limited himself to just pointillism. Self-imposed limits can often be liberating, and I find that they increase creativity rather than diminish it. Because too many choices can lead to paralysis. Writers can get writer's block, but artists can also get artist block. And by removing the clutter of unnecessary choices, it really helps you to refine and focus your aesthetic vision. It gives you a framework to work within. So instead of going broad, you can go deep. You can really drill down and deeply explore a theme, a style, or an idea. But having said that, I always try to break free of conventions. This is a later work where I kind of threw away a lot of the conventions I just talked about, but I left in just enough to still trigger that, res that response of financial documents. Because rules are made to be broken, and the rules are necessary because they give you a starting point and you can break free from there. And also, money art is essentially anti-establishment. It is transgressive by nature. <coughs> like graffiti, making your own money is illegal. There's a word for it, it's called counterfeiting. There's another money artist out there, his name is J.S.G. Boggs, he's a little more famous than I am. But uh, his work looked so much like money that his studio was actually raided by the Secret Service. <laughs> and uh, they didn't charge him with a crime, but they took everything out of his studio and they never gave it back. Um, and his art was about the actual art, the actual transaction itself. He really questioned the value of money and that consensual reality. He wanted to investigate that. Um, and I mention Boggs mainly because money art, like all fine art genres, different artists can use it to explore different ideas and achieve different artistic results. But for me also, money art is ultimately about ideas. So I don't like to make purely aesthetic images. I like to communicate ideas. Because for me, art needs to say something. And I use art to comment on society. Also, I believe money art has elements of storytelling in it. Because words and images together can very often tell a story, and especially multiple images together, they can make almost a storyboard and create a false narrative. And uh, for me also, they are, they're like artifacts. They're believable artifacts from a world that should or perhaps should not exist. Now many times, this is another older work I did in color pencil, uh, many times I would reach back into my older body of work and bring it into the money art. Um, this piece is called Necessity Stepchild, because in necessity, if necessity's child is invention, then her stepchild is pollution. So I would, I would take this image next, and I, would, and I literally incorporated it into a piece of money art. And I did this also to, because it really helped integrate money art into my larger body of work. As I said, I did work for 20 or 30 years before I started doing money art. So this really tied them together into, more, into a more unified body of work. Plus it helped me to develop my own personal uh, visual vocabulary. But most especially for me, um, I like to think of money art as appropriating the language of power. Because only governments can make money. Money is the tool of the state. 
and by using the visual vocabulary of the establishment and turning it, uh, turning it against them, I like to call it stealing the voice of power to criticize power. And I find that's ideal for political commentary and satire. Uh, because money art, I think, is better, is better than many other forms of political art, because built into money art is a structural language of authority itself. And uh, using, using satire and humor is also less threatening. People are more likely to listen to what you're saying. Plus, the humor often bypasses barriers and preconceptions that people will always bring to your work. And I'm hoping <laughs> it will help people see things from a new perspective. My journey into money art, how it all began, um, was with this note here. Um, back in the early 90s, I was very active uh, in actually doing dream work. I was part of a dream group that met in the city. We would meet once a week and discuss our dreams and tell our dreams. And so in the early 90s, I had a dream where I was in the New York City subway system, and I suddenly found myself with a whole pile of strange and bizarre looking and very colorful money. And so in the dream, I set out these long tables and I spread out the money on the table and uh, very quickly a crowd gathered, and so I started giving it away, and they were happy to take it. People were laughing and smiling, and people were grabbing the money, and was, everybody was having a good time. And at the end of the dream, uh, all I had left was a small handful of this very colorful money. So I woke up, and I wrote the dream down, as I wrote down all my dreams at the time, and I kind of forgot about it for a few years. Then around 1999, um, I had a production company at that time making films. It was called Antarctica Film Arts. I was trying to find a way to promote not only the company but the website in a kind of unusual way, kind of trying to think outside the box, how can I use something unusual to promote the website? And uh, suddenly I remembered the dream. I said I could make this strange piece of money from Antarctica. The company's name was Antarctica, so I thought it was perfect. So I made this first Antarctica dream dollar, and I would put the website URL on it, and I would spread it all over town. I'd leave them on tables, drop them on the street, put them in tip jars, I'd leave them in, on tips with servers and restaurants, but I left them in addition to a tip. I didn't stiff my servers. Uh, and one funny story was, I was uh, at a restaurant in the city, and we, went, we finished the dinner, we were standing on the sidewalk, and uh, the waitress came running out. She said, are you the guy with the weird money? I'm like, yeah. She said, my manager took it away. Can I have another one? <laughs> so I gave her another one. She went back inside. Then out came the busboy. Can I have one, too? <laughs> so I, I gave him one, too. So it became un very unexpectedly popular. You know, I also remember leaving a tip, went to a like, film forum downtown, there was a tip jar. I leave it in a tip jar, but then I kind of like stand around and, and listen. And the two guys snatched it out and say, you're arguing, is Antarctica really a country? I don't know, yes it is. We're just having this whole discussion about Antarctica. So it, was, it just turned out to be very, you know, very unexpectedly popular. So I, I continued and I, I, made, I made more, another note. I made a $1 note. And then again, I made a $7 note. And uh, at this point, I kind of realized it was turning into something, a, lot, a little more than just a, um, just a promotional piece. It was turning into a project all by itself. So at that point, I, I, I created the story of Nadiria, the lost colony of Antarctica. And was a, I wrote this whole world, a whole detailed story about a utopian colony that was populated by artists, writers, and free thinkers that lived under the ice shelf in Antarctica in the late 1800s. And as I wrote the story, the story informed the notes, and the notes informed the story. And I wound up with uh, eight, eight denominations in the Dream Dollar system. And I call these the natural number system, because I figured they're living under the ice shelf at the bottom of the world. They're cut off from all the natural cycles of nature, so the money would reinforce the natural rhythms and cycles of nature. And they pair off to form years. But the one pairs off with the 365, because there are 365 days in a year. That's one year. There are four uh, seasons in the year, times 91 days in the season. Um, seven days in a week, times 52 weeks in a year. At 13 lunar cycles, times 28 days in a lunar cycle. So they all pair off the form years. And further, for each denomination, I created four different mid-marks. Again, the winter, spring, summer, and autumn, the natural rhythms of nature. So each denomination had a it was essentially the same design, but had a slightly different design modification for each one. So that totaled a total of 32 different notes in the Dream Dollar system. It took roughly five years to complete, from 1999 to 2004. 
And I just kind of put it up on the website. I didn't really promote it, but uh, the media actually started to, to notice me. My first piece of press coverage was actually from a financial magazine in Bucharest, Romania. Thankfully, <laughs> the, uh, the author was courteous enough to let me know, otherwise I would never have found out it was in Bucharest. But it was a full page spread, and I hadn't done any real promotion. Um, and so other, other media outlets started to notice, I started getting some more press coverage. Next. And this is my absolute favorite review from Wired magazine. If you've ever known an acid freak who likes to spend hours mumbling about the Illuminati symbolism on the back of a dollar bill, hand him a dream dollar sometime. He'll claw off his own face. <laughs> so that's, that's still my favorite review. <laughs> and also, what happened, sort of happened with galleries. Uh, I got invited into a few gallery shows. Uh, and at the time, I admit I was rather jaded, rather cynical about the gallery, the art industry, so I never pursued galleries. but. They started to come to me. I was a curator approached me, and I got into a show in the UK, in New York, and then it, and then it traveled to the, uh, the Palais de Tokyo Contemporary Art Museum in Paris. So things were going along quite well, and then the 9/11 happened. As you remember, 9/11 changed America, and it changed the world, and it changed me. Um, it politicized me. It kind of awoke within me a political consciousness. Before that, I was apolitical. For 20 years or more, I was making just fantasy and science fiction art. But now I wanted to comment on the world around me through my art. And uh, so I made my first political note. The United States of Islam note was inspired directly by the, the Iraq war in 2003. It was my first political note, my first anti-war note. I wanted to comment on the greater war on terror. It was kind of a thought experiment, basically. What if we lost? and the Taliban took over. The Taliban was, the, of course, the enemy we were fighting at the time. So it was really a cautionary tale. I wanted to think the unthinkable. What if America lost? As a superpower, we never asked that question, which makes us enter into war far too easily. I also wanted to comment on uh, radical Islam, and Sharia, and the oppression of women under fundamentalism. And that's why the first series was the $3 series, which uh, we call Great Women of the Past, because under, under fundamentalist Sharia law, there would be no great women of the future. As the wars continued, I made more political notes, and here's when I started to discover the fun of deconstructing uh, national icons. I was having fun subverting cultural symbols, and I discovered that people had really strong emotional reactions to that, there was almost a religious fervor for national symbols, and I found that very interesting. But I feel that challenging national symbols helps to keep them alive. It forces us to think about what they really mean. It spurs discussions about crucial concepts of what it means to be an American. And also it keeps the symbols from devolving into rigid dogma and propaganda. This is George Washington crossing the Euphrates. He began hacking an iconic image of the state pushing oil barrels away instead of icebergs. Um, and I feel that bringing icons into a contemporary context, uh, it really forces us to re-examine its meaning and to perhaps discover new meanings. And as the wars continued, I was making more, stronger and stronger statements about the wars. Um, this one's pretty on the nose. That's the, uh, the angel of death or the god of war, however you choose to see him. I use the symbol of the ace of spades, which is a traditional uh, symbol for death. On the back is the pile of skulls around oil barrels, which for me was mirroring the, uh, the, pro the cries of the protesters in the streets at the time, no blood for oil, so that's kind of a reference to that. And the, the denomination is number 13, unlucky number 13. And the color of the note is blood red. And at the bottom you see the shields of the corporate clans. If you go into any European castle, you in the great room you see standards and flags of all the clans that took part in the war. And these are the corporate clans that took part in the war. So around 2008, um, I kind of hit a crisis point. I really wanted to work on a bigger canvas. I was frankly getting tired of working on these little tiny notes that are really small. And frankly, it's a bit of a pain in the butt. So I wanted a bigger canvas to, to say more things. And so I created certificates. These resemble stock certificates rather than currency notes. They're printed on one side only, but they still allow them to have more complexity. 
Um, also at the time, I acquired a color laser printer, which, needless to say, transformed my work. Um, I was, it was inevitable to get one, and uh, my wife urged me to get one. She's the great enabler. It also allowed me to do more mixed media. You can see there's a lot of mixed media in here. There's a stamp there, the SUV, the Socially Unacceptable Vehicle Stamp. And those are real stamps, not stickers. I've had to find a guy in Germany who would print them on dry gummed paper with perforations like the old-fashioned stamps. So I would lift them and stick them and have my DNA on every print. <laughs> um, I also had a rubber stamp, uh, which is true a lot of my work. I make a custom rubber stamp with an ink pad and I hand stamp each note by hand. And there's the, uh, you can see the HC with the chain, that is an actual chemical watermark on the paper. It's a security feature in the form of a watermark. Um, so like all watermarks, if you held it up to the light, you would see it be lighter than the paper around it. And the HC with the chain stands for a hydrocarbon chain, which is the basis for all fossil fuels. And of course, there's the gold foil seal with a hand, with a custom embosser, no more cheap oil. So I really enjoyed piling on the, the mixed media, which made them a lot more of a handmade item rather than just a simple print. Certificates also allowed me to expand the scope of my work. Uh, the, the United States of Islam, the Empire of America, the State of War, those are all anti-war notes. But certificates allowed me to look at larger issues, to, look, to comment on corporations and capitalism, to comment on society and not just the government. Also, they allowed me to make, deal with more timeless issues and universal concepts. You can see this was done in 2013, but it's actually more re relevant now than it was then. These certificates allow me to look at the larger cultural picture and find a more universal meaning in the work, rather than simply commenting on current events. Also, I discovered that good political art does three things. It should reference the past, it should observe the present, and it should remain meaningful to future viewers. And it does so by finding deeper truths within the current events. And good art is, should be elevated above simple propaganda and jingoism, because art should reveal truths about the human condition. And art should also create a discussion with the viewer. Good art should always have a discussion between the viewer and the piece. You know, it should not be simple, it should be a back and forth, because viewers, all artists know that viewers will bring their own connotations and baggage with them and extract meanings from your work that you don't intend. But that's a good thing. That's a good thing. It should be a discussion. It should be a back and forth. Without that discussion, art becomes simple propaganda, especially political work. And that's propaganda is where art tells you what to think. Art shouldn't tell you what to think. It should invite you to think. Also around this time, I, uh, I got the interest in doing some political activism with my work. Uh, I created this Indebted States of America note in 2009 in response to the Great Recession of 2008. And right around then, there were trillion dollar bailouts for banks, bailouts for the auto industry, financial institutions, and anything too big to fail. So in 2010, I decided to have my own bailout for America. So I took the trillion dollar notes that I had just made, and I sent one to each and every of the 535 representatives and senators in the United States Congress. I attached a letter urging fiscal restraint and I designed a whole letterhead and envelope to make it kind of a branded package. Well, let's just say the response from Congress was rather underwhelming. <laughs> but, uh, nobody responded, but uh, I think the interns took them. But, uh, but I did get interviewed uh, by congress.org. Uh, they were writing an article on how art was used for activism, so I got interviewed for that. And I got covered on a few other blogs and websites, most notably The Art of the Prank by Joey Skaggs. And Joey Skaggs, if you're interested in political pranks, Joey Skaggs is one of our best in, uh, pranksters in America. Also in 2011, an interesting opportunity presented itself. Um, I had heard that the Occupy Wall Street movement was officially having a currency design competition. And so I heard that about that through a friend, and I kind of decided to enter. Because I, after commenting on culture for years, I wanted to be part of a political event, not just comment from the sidelines. Now, I didn't agree with many of Occupy's positions and statements, but better Wall Street regulation was needed to prevent another crash that we had in 2008. Their plan was to make a souvenir note, which they would sell for fundraising, but also they wanted to have it uh, have the back be simple so everyone could sign it. You would hang out on the picket lines, you'd make friends, you'd sign it, 
and you, you, you take it away as a souvenir note. And uh, that interested me for, an, for a very specific reason. It was actually a reference to history. In World War II, there was this thing called short snorters. Uh, it began in the aviation community in the 1930s, but really became popular around World War II, uh, where, you know, near the end of the war, things were winding down, the guys in your unit or aboard your aircraft, you'd all sign, sign the notes, you know, so, and they'd pass the notes around, everybody would have one with everybody's signature on, signature on it as a souvenir, but they called them short snorters because if you sign someone's note, and if you came to them a week later and you, and you asked them to present it to him, if he couldn't present it to you, he owed you a drink or a dollar. <laughs> so that became a tradition. So when I heard about this design competition, uh, it was only 10 days before the deadline. So I literally dropped everything and really slammed it out, which is why I reused the exploding banker from the first nationalized bank certificate because I simply had no time. And uh, well, I won the competition, uh, but shortly after that, Occupy Wall Street movement kind of fizzled out. But uh, what, another good thing happened from it is that the Guardian magazine in Guardian newspaper in London covered it in a special money issue that was published in December of 2011. Now, the most, I think the boldest and strongest statement I've made with my money art is, is this next piece here. I was invited to participate in an exhibition of the Zealand's Posten and newspaper offices in Copenhagen, Denmark. As you may remember, Zealand's Posten was the epicenter of the infamous Mohammed cartoon jihad of 2005. In the years after 9-11, several terror attacks happened in Europe to intimidate the press and the media, most notably the assassination of the Dutch filmmaker Theo van Gogh in 2004. So in 2005, the Zealand's Post and Newspaper commissioned 12 cartoons of Mohammed from professional cartoonists, and they printed them to assert a free press. Well, needless to say, throughout the Middle East and Europe, there were riots, violence, and murder, and over 125 people died over cartoons. So in 2007, an exhibition was set up at the Zealand's Post and offices to commemorate the event. Um, I was invited into the show, and I was very honored to be invited in, and I created this piece specifically for the show. I wanted to make a strong statement against the attacks on free speech and on the freedom of the press. Also, since these attacks continued with the attacks on the Charlie Hebdo office in 2015, I think it's still relevant today. And another thing that came out of this is that that did inspire me to continue the USI series. Um, I made the $1 note um, based on that. And then the year after that, I made the $6 note, kind of rounded out. On a lighter note, <laughs> um, in 2012, I started a new project, which I called Coupons. Coupons are simple ideas on, uh, with simpler designs. They're printed one side on security paper. You can see the hashtag pattern of the paper. That's the same type of paper that banks use to print checks on. And using security paper and security features, this is kind of a tradition in the money art community. There are other money art artists out there. And using security features and security paper is just kind of a tradition. It's kind of another reference to that financial vocabulary. I started making these coupons. I can make them quickly. I could turn them out in about a day or two, rather than a few weeks to, to a month or two, like on the larger pieces. So in that respect, they're a little more like political cartoons. But uh, integral to the concept of of uh, the coupons is that I wanted to give them away. Kind of going full circle to that dream I had where I was giving money away in the subway, I really wanted to give away, to leave these in the street for people to find. So what I did was a campaign of what I call coupon drops. I would leave them in the street, take a few photos, and just walk away and let, let people find them on the street. This is the very first drop, and this is the exact place in the subway where I had that dream in the early 90s. I wanted to come full circle to that exact spot where I had the dream. It's just really my form of street art. I'm too old to be a graffiti artist, <laughs> so this is my form of street art, and I, I really understand what, what the thing is with street art, because finding, encountering art on the street, it, it is a personal confrontation. It's, it's, it interrupts your life. If you see art on the web, there's literally millions of artists out there you're just scrolling on by, okay, but, but if, you, if you come upon something on the street, it stops you up short, it interrupts your life, and it's more of a personal encounter with the work. So I continued these drops for several years. Um, this is at City Hall in New York. Free gun coupons in front of City Hall. I literally had to wait 20 minutes for all the police to move out of the way. <laughs> Free gun coupons. Um, 
And some of these pieces you may you may notice are not on the show. That was I, I have a lot of work and a lot of, most of it well some of it wouldn't fit in the gallery, but they're all in my books in the back if you want. So here's just more coupon drops. There's some radiation-free coupons dropped on the anniversary of 9/11. There's the Jacob Javits Center. There's the General Post Office, and then there's the United Nations Building. Uh, the free Syrian gas mask coupons <laughs> in front of the United Nations. I was really hoping an ambassador would find those. You know, and the, the and the Syrian gas mask coupons were made in direct response to, of course, the to the actual gas attacks in Syria that were happening. Um, literally. Most of this work are reactions to world events, and it's kind of like a, a tour of the last 15 years in world history, because they're all pretty much related to specific events that happen. So to finish up the talk, I thought I'd discuss a little about my process and how I make them on the art. Um, they are all large, very large collages done in Photoshop. They're a combination of, of scanned engravings and hand-drawn elements. And when I do collage, I don't I want them to look like a single unified image. I don't want them to look like a collage. Some collage artists slam together color and black and white and everything, but that's you know that's fine. But it's not what I like to do. I like it to look like it's a single unified image, which makes it a lot harder to find elements that work together, and it just makes the whole process a lot more difficult. Um, I would spend hours and hours looking for just the right image to combine. I have a collection of hundreds of old books of engravings and periodicals ranging from around 1850 to 1900. And I, I have hundreds of them. Uh, I've been collecting for over about 20 years. And you have to just go through them for hours and hours and hours just to find just the right element. And when I finally find the right element, I scan it at a very high resolution, usually around 1200 DPI, which is four times normal resolution, just so I have the freedom to zoom in and manipulate. And I also like to use hand-drawn elements as well. Uh, besides all the retouching that I do, I, I do some uh, hand-drawn elements right from the beginning, like here's the Electric Nation title, and that's just it's hand-drawn with a pen on the illustration board, the old-fashioned way. Um, I could learn Adobe Illustrator, but I just I like to work with my hands. I still like to draw, and I still draw even while I'm making the money art. So here's the hand-drawn title, and there it is incorporated into the final design. So let's build a certificate from scratch. Let's start with one of my favorite pieces, the uh, first nationalized Bank of America. As you can see, it's, I take it almost to completion in black and white, and I add color as the very last step. Because for me, the composition has to work uh, in black and white. Because color is, I wouldn't say it's extraneous, but it really doesn't do much for the comp composition. So I can, everything has to work in terms of the lights and darks and the values. Everything should work in black and white first. Then I add color as the very last step. So, we start with the vignette in the center. I always start with the vignette, because for me that's the heart of the piece. It's the kind of the central image that drives the narrative of the piece. Here's where, how I found the banker in, in the wild, in its native habitat, which was a, I think, 1882 Harper's Illustrated Weekly. This is how I found him. You know, he's surrounded by all kinds of clutter and other stuff. So the first thing I do is I cut him out, cut out the part I want, and clean him up a little bit. So that's the isolated elements that I'm going to use. I didn't like his head, so I got another head from another illustration. Because for me, well, for a lot of people, the uh, metaphor of the top hat represents banker or capitalist. So I wanted, I wanted to have a top hat. So uh, I got that, and I grabbed some more money from the rest of that image, but I rearranged it. To, I flipped it to the other side and, and changed the position, and I rearranged it just so it has a nice arc coming out. And I took a, a cut of the uh, capital dome, and I got a million of those. So I put that in the back, but I ghosted it back 50% because I like to have a nice foreground background separation. I learned that in photography. Always have a foreground background separation. It makes the image much easier to read. And then I put a vignette around it to kind of make it the final vignette for the piece. Now, let me just say that finding the right pieces that go together is pretty difficult. Because there are a lot of constraints. The, uh, there's, not everything is, is compatible. Um, there are different styles of work, of engraving, and first off, the lighting direction. The lighting is coming from the left and the shadows are on the right. Every single element has to have the light coming from the same direction. And the line weight has to be the same. Some engravers use thick lines, some use very thin lines, so you can't combine those. You have to find just the same line weight. You have to use the same style. Some engravers are very tight and photorealistic, and other engravers are very loose and sketchy, so you can't combine those. 
So you really have to work hard to find compatible elements that not just have the image you want, but have the style and the line weight and the lighting. Everything has to match, which makes it very difficult and extremely time consuming. So, um, also, cleaning it up, it's, all the books I have are 100 to 150 years old, and they're usually very cheaply printed, so the books themselves are either over-inked or under-inked, and the paper is brown or yellow, so there's hours and hours and hours of cleaning up and, and making it clean enough to read. It's often almost smeared, and the blacks aren't solid, and the whites are dark, so you have to do a lot of retouching and cleaning. Once you find the element, there's, there's hours of cleaning involved, too. So now that the vignette is done, I take that and flatten it and I put it into the main file. In the main image, I usually start with the border um, because that really just defines the space. It's like the frame it lives within. But you can see already I've done a lot of work on it. It's often I would find just a section of the border, probably from a stock certificate. But you have to make it go all the way around and see the pattern. The pattern really, really has to match there. You really have to, have to work hard to make the pattern you know, really blend and match. That corner wasn't there, I had to make it. And so then you have the top pieces and the inner border. So this already has several hours of work already invested in it. And so I just keep layering in uh, the elements one by one. There's some inner borders, actually two inner borders, and then some more corner pieces. And you can see I often add a drop shadow here, which gives it a kind of 3D look. Um, and so basically just keep layering it on. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Photoshop, but Photoshop, the best way to work in Photoshop is what they call non-destructively, where you do everything in layers. So each and every element is on its own separate layer, which allows me to keep it ed editable all the way to the very end. If you blend them together and mash them together, then you're kind of stuck, you can't change it. So every single element is on its own layer. And by the time it's done, there's often 50 to 100 layers of all the elements stacked up. So you just keep adding more stuff, you add the flags at the top and some uh, text boxes at the bottom for the denomination. And then there's the, the type and the fonts in there, and there's a place for the, that's for the serial number there. Added some more type, I, put a, I darken the area behind first so the word first pops out, and there's a lot of little things to do to make, just to make it readable and clear. Um, and a word about the, the lettering, uh, those are not fonts. Fonts are in fact too clean, they wouldn't match since everything else in the piece is scanned in from an actual source. If I used fonts, the fonts would be too clean, it, would really, it wouldn't blend. So even the letters are scanned from available lettering that I find in documents and other things. And very often I don't have all the letters I need, like the Z. If they didn't have a Z, I had to make that Z from another letter. And many letters had to be made because these fonts, I would often find just one word and I'd have to try to extract the letters and rebuild new letters with it. So even the lettering and the numbering is all scanned and manipulated. The denomination of the data coming in and in doubt we trust. And you just keep adding on more and more layers to add that complexity. So it's, it's to trigger that emotional response that we have for money, there needs to be a certain layer, a certain level of complexity. And you just gotta keep building up the complexity until it reaches a level where, it's, where, it, where it reads as money. Otherwise, if it's too simple, I don't think it works. Okay, and then you add some more official elements, like, like the bank seal there and the usury seal here. I took the treasury seal and converted it to a usury seal. Um, and I've reused that a lot in, a, in several of the pieces. Um, not, only, not only is that a big time saver, but it also creates a kind of a branding, a style. By, by reusing certain elements in a lot of my pieces, it creates a very, you know, it creates a visual style that's recognizable, it's kind of my style. Uh, creates my own visual vocabulary. Um, so it's, you look at a shepherd fairy and you recognize a shepherd fairy immediately because he reuses a lot of elements and textures. So it's <clears throat> just a way of branding and creating a personal style. There's the color with the last step. Um, I didn't do it step by step, it just would take too much time. But basically, um, again, for those of you who know Photoshop, I don't, I don't Say these, uh, the, that previous piece had, say, 75 layers, which it probably did have. Um, I don't go in there and I add the color directly to the borders or anything with the green, because that would be <coughs> destructive editing and I'd be stuck with it. So what I do is I add the color, I add a color layer on top of every black and white layer and apply the color to layer properties that may be too technical. But needless to say, if there are 75 black and white layers with an element on each one, there's a color layer for each black and white layers, so now there's 150 layers all stacked up 
which gives me total freedom to make changes anywhere along the process and to make it editable even after it's done if I want to make a change. So this is the, uh, the final piece uh, ready for printing. So when I, I print them at home on my own uh, high resolution color laser printer, I don't send them out to a service bureau. But what I do is I flatten this whole thing to a more manageable size, but I leave the serial number here as editable type. So what I would do is I would say print number 123, it would come out, and I print on, I print on very thick um, archival grade, museum grade paper. I check it out, okay, I go and change it to 124, print it, it would come out, okay, 125. So I print them one at a time, changing the serial numbers each time, and I keep a record, of course, of the serial numbers, so when I reach the end of the edition, it stops. So now it's ready for multimedia. This is the print file. So they, again, I went back to the guy in Germany who made those post-it stamps, and I made a red and a yellow version of this. Uh, these are trillion dollar uh, stamps. Uh, I was very fortunate in this case. I was working at a large ad, ad agency at the time, and they, I, I put out a call. I didn't want this, anyone speak Chinese to translate for me, because I am a stickler for accuracy. And the Chinese is real translated Chinese. The Farsi is real translated Farsi. You know, the, 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 um, the uh, barcode on the Monsanto thing is the actual barcode for Roundup. You know, I'm, very, I'm a real stickler for, for precision and detail. So, in the center it says $1 trillion, and on the outside it says Central Bank of China, uh, $1 trillion right now. So that's what it says in, in Chinese. So I would, I would again, tear it out, lick it, and stick it. And that's the yellow one uh, affixed to it, and the red's on the other side. And then I'd make the uh, rubber stamp. And uh, that's the original file for the rubber stamp. Again, it says Central Bank of China. And what I would do is, it's really easy to make your own custom rubber stamp. You just can create artwork the same size, and you send it out to a service bureau, or it used to be a stationery store, but now it's something else. And there's the final piece, with the stamps and seals applied, ready for framing. Thanks for coming, and <laughs> thank you very much. We have some time for any questions. Yes? Don't you have a problem with the government defacing the United States mm -hmm. of, um, currency? And also, you mentioned the logo of a company. Is there, is it, some of those things are copyrighted. Yes, there is. Um, actually, the, the, from what I understand, the law in this country is that you can reproduce a, a currency note, but it must be 10% larger or 10% smaller or in black and white. I believe that's the law. Because sometimes you see, you know, you know, the car commercials, President's Day sales, you see a little dollar bill, but if it's, if it's significantly smaller or larger, it's legal. And in terms of using uh, company names, um, Basically what I'm doing is satire, and satire is protected speech. It's called fair use. And as long as I'm making a, a social commentary and I'm not trying to infringe actually on their business, it, it is legal. It's called okay. fair use. Thank you. But wouldn't the paper be different than United States currency paper anyway? Yes, it? that's true. Okay. The United States, United States currency paper is a secret formula. No one knows exactly what's in it, but I know it involves blue jeans. <laughs> for, for cotton. <laughs> Seriously, they take old blue jeans and use the cotton. But it's, there's a single paper manufacturer that manufactures the paper, and only they make it, and, and they deliver it in armored trucks to the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. So yeah, it's a very special so paper. So you feel different anyway, right? Yeah, it's a very special paper, yeah. I just wondered, would you be able to talk on that? Um, I know it was the cover of the uh, show, oh. so I was wondering if you would just comment on it. Dread and Circuses, yes. That basically for me, it's, it's actually a very recent work. It's one of the most recent works on the show. And for me, it's, it's, it's George is a symbol, Washington. Our capital is named after him. Our money is named after our money. He's on our money. He's on everything. So that for me, Washington is a symbol for the government. He's a symbol for the, for the nation. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not impugning the reputation of President Washington. I admire him greatly, but he's, he is a symbol for Washington, D.C., and for, I, for me, I think Washington, D.C. is pretty much a circus right now. <laughs> so that kind of reflects my view of, of the circus that is Washington right now, Washington, D.C. So he's a symbol. He's a metaphor for the government. It's not, not the president himself. So it was done the same way on the computer? With yeah, that was done the same way. Um, I had to, yeah, I found a really good engraving of him, and I scanned it again at a very high resolution so it could be blown up. And the, uh, well, the color was all painted on by hand, again in layers. 
But that one I did send out. I don't have a printer that big, so I sent that out to a service bureau for printing. Yes? Two questions. One is, um, is there a story behind the polka dot gun that you have up here at the end? <laughs> yeah, yes. That's kind of like my personal symbol. Um, I call it Wonder Gun. Uh, for me, it's a commentary. I've been doing, even with my color pencil work, I've been doing a lot of social commentary work for many years. And for me, that's a comment on our nation's uh, obsession with violence as entertainment. And our, our uh, arguably the nation's, I wouldn't say obsession with guns, but certainly the debate about guns control, the debate is, is obsessing our country. But more, more, more than that, it's about violence as entertainment. You know, I mean, you see blood splatter movies, and we call it entertainment. Mm -hmm. So that's... The other question is on the Antarctica series. Mm -hmm. There were certain names of people, I didn't know if those were real people, or made of Tamaran and Constance and a couple of those, those are all made up characters, yeah. There's, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to include the Dream Dollars in the show, but there was simply no room. It's 32 different notes. There's, I, I wanted to make the theme for the show a little more focused in terms of political satire. Mm -hmm. So, and the Dream Dollars is actually a fantasy project. It's not political satire, but uh, yeah, those are all characters in the story. You can go to the website and read all about them. I've written a bunch of little stories. So yeah, they're all characters. Any other questions? Okay, great. Thanks okay. very much for coming. Books for sale. Ah, also, books for sale. Stephen will sign for you if you would like to. And the books. Yeah, the money art, the two different books there, the one book is Capital Offenses, which is my first book, and that's focusing mainly on political satire, and that has other stuff in, besides the money art, it has other things I've done, like a lawn sign project I've done, and stickers and stamps and other things. take a picture of Van White sitting up your books there. Van White. Oh, okay. <laughs> How long did it take you to do one of these? Um, well, the, 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 the certificates, which are more larger pieces, they took several weeks each, you know. I mean, then again, I did these when I was still working, so I would, I would come home and spend two or three hours a night, spend a few hours on the weekend. So, yeah, several, several weeks of work for each one, depending on the complexity. <coughs> and so the Money Art book, if you like the Antarctica Dream Dollars, the Money Art book has all the currency notes, including the including those, those larger, like the, uh, the from the, the um, Bank of International Art Money. That was that note with the blood splatter. There was a whole series of those done for a, a Bank of International Art Money in Copenhagen, Denmark, plus the Dream Dollars are in there. So Money Art has currency art only, and Capital Offenses has political stuff, including more than currency. Great, thank you very much. Thank you.